In today's world, people feel lost in a sea of ideas. Which ones should we accept? Stay tuned because you're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Here is your host, Kurt Jarris. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Ignore that last bit. I'm not Kurt Jaros. How are you guys doing today? Welcome to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. My name is Chris Yeisley. I'm normally on the panel sitting on the opposite side of the bench of Kurt. But today, uh, our fearless leader, Kurt Jaros, is taking a much-needed day off to spend with his family, and I volunteered to help run things here at the base of Veracity Hill. How are you all doing today, guys? How was your holiday, your turkey day? Um... It's a great time for me, especially since I am a uh, single man living in an apartment and living out of a microwave day to day. The other 364 days of the year, I am very thankful for a hearty Thanksgiving meal Uh, and was very just delighted to have a very quiet, relaxing day um, with not much stress at all. Lots of good food, good tea, good pie, and a nice brisk walk in the cool weather. Um, And I hope all of you are still alive after the Black Friday madness That ensued, but welcome to Saturday. Welcome to Saturday. We are in the middle of a glorious four to five day weekend, and we are going to be talking about things that pertain to truth, as we usually do upon the show. But since um, I am in the studio today and not Kurt, we are going to be talking about something a little bit different. We spent the last couple months leading up to the election, if you remember, talking about truth in the arena specifically of politics. Uh, And we are all done with that now. We had a lovely show last week, kind of wrapping that all up. And today we'll be beginning a one-off or a series that uh, we may do again in the future, depending on what you guys think and uh, how everything is received. Uh, we're going to be doing a series today on the book Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. Now, um, the book is one of my favorite books, and it's uh, a glorious, glorious little snapshot of what Christians believe. And today, actually, despite the title of the book, we're actually going to not spend a lot of time talking about Christianity and I'll explain that in a second. But uh, as we go forward today, uh, I hope you will forgive my voice quality. The week has left me with a bitter cold uh, that I have been fighting for most of the week, and it has robbed me of my otherwise boisterous voice. Uh, so if I turn my head to cough for a moment or I don't come through very clearly, I hope you all be very patient with me as I struggle through this along with you. Um, so today, specifically, I would like us all to kind of step back for a moment and um, I want to talk to you today, not as an American citizen or as a Christian, but as a fellow human being. And I'm going to take that worldview cap off. And if you're listening today and you're a Christian, I, um, I, I pray you'll indulge with me for a moment and uh, take the Christian worldview cap off for just a moment. If you are um, a Muslim or a, a Buddhist, a humanist, um, agnostic, atheist, evolutionist, a communist, whatever, I pray that you will take these worldviews off for just a moment because um, I would like to talk about some things that pertain to all of us as fellow human beings of made of the same stuff, flesh and blood, who are dealing and living on the same planet. Um, every now and then it, as human beings, it benefits us to step back and take moral inventory of ourselves, to wide shot our existence and to wide shot why we are here to think about these things and whether or not you put aside time to do it Most likely, if you are a human, you have found yourself faced with these types of questions. Why am I here? Who am I really? Is there a cause or meaning behind life? Or is it meaningless? Excuse me. Is it meaningless? Broadly, these types of questions are all referred to under a kind of a broad blanket that's sometimes referred to as the human condition. We kind of stumble through life with these questions, and they're all common. No matter where we're coming from, what society, time period, civilization, worldview, or religion we have come from, we all ask these questions at some point of our life, or we find ourselves very horrifically staring them square in the face without an answer. And so I would like to um, take some time with you today and see if we can address some of these questions. And I can't think of somebody, anyone better in my mind, who I've read, who does this better than C.S. Lewis. Many of you may be familiar with him. If you've never heard of him before, he has written many great nonfiction books on the subject of Christianity, but also some fiction books, most popular of which is the Chronicle of Narnia series. I believe that is seven uh, different books slanted toward children. Um, He was also a contemporary of the great, excuse me, of the great J.R. Tolkien. 
Um, and they actually swapped ideas back and forth, both of their fiction and nonfiction uh, variety and also of the worldview variety. They spent a lot of time just bouncing off of each other um, and they were very good friends. So, but C.S. Lewis is a very, very well-educated man um, and a very poetic man. And he was not theologically sound when he became a Christian, but he learned how to take the basic truths of Christianity and make them so all humans could understand it, regardless of education level or world background. And for the duration of this talk, for most of the rest of this talk, I'm probably not going to be mentioning anything about Christianity or God or gods or any such notion. We're just going to build toward that eventually, but we're going to start on common ground with a clean slate. So I hope, regardless of your worldview, you'll come to this talk with an open mind, um, because I'm not going to be mentioning Christianity for the bulk of it. I'm not going to be mentioning God or gods or any such notion. Um, until toward the end, and I hope by the time we get to the end, you'll understand why we have to bring it up. Um, but even then, I'm going to be avoiding um, whether or not these things are true or not. We may need to mention them out of necessity, but I'm not going to be. Tr- I'm going to be trying to avoid adhering to any specific worldview today. And I hope, uh, whether or not you're Christian or not, you will understand why over the course of this talk. I hope you excuse me as I. Take some drinks of water today to kind of keep up the pace that we need to be going at. Um, so sometimes I will be um, giving summaries of what C.S. Lewis is talking about. Other times um, I will be reading right for the book because I can't really think of anyone else who um, says what he says better than he does. Um, so you'll excuse me as we, as we go forth today. Um, I'm going to start by reading the very first section of the very first pers- part of this book, Mere Christianity. Would not be dissuaded by the title. Once again, we're not talking about Christianity quite yet. So listen to these words from C.S. Lewis. And once again, bear, quali- bear, uh, bear in mind with the quality of my voice. Everyone has heard people quarreling. Sometimes it sounds funny, and sometimes it sounds merely unpleasant. But however it sounds, I believe we can learn something very important from listening to the kind of things they say. They say things like this. How do you like it if anyone did the same to you? That's my seat. I was there first. Leave him alone. He isn't doing you any harm. Why should you shove in first? Hey, give me a bit of your orange. I gave you a bit of mine. Come on, you promised. People say things like this every day, educated people as well as uneducated, and children as well as grown-ups. Now, what interests me about all these remarks is that the man who makes them is not merely saying that the other man's behavior does not happen to please him. He is appealing to some kind of standard of behavior which he expects the other man to know about. And the other man very seldom replies, to hell with your standard. Nearly always, he tries to make out that what he has been doing does not really go against the standard. Or if it does, that there was some kind of special excuse. He pretends there is some special reason in this particular case why, why the person who took the seat first should not keep it, or that things were quite different when he was given the bit of orange, or why something has turned up, which lets him keep off, um, keeping his promise. It looks, in fact, very much as if both parties had in mind some kind of law or rule of fair play or decent behavior or morality or whatever you like to call it, about which they really agreed. And they have. If they had not, they might, of course, fight like animals, but they could not quarrel in the human sense of the word. Quarreling means trying to show that the other man is in the wrong. And there would be no sense in trying to do that unless you and I had some sort of agreement as to what right and wrong are, just as there would be no sense in saying that a footballer had committed a foul unless there is some sort of agreement about the rules of football. So this is a very interesting beginning here. We see a couple things pop up. The one, subconsciously, we all kind of have this agreement about what right and wrong should be. Now, bear in mind, of course, as civilizations have come and go, the exact needle has fallen in different places as to right or wrong. But me and you living in this society today, we have agreements about what and right and wrong should be, and more often than not, when you wrong me or I wrong you, um, you come at me with an argument that tries to put me in the wrong, that say, hey, what you did did not appeal to this thing that I expect you to know about, right? I could not quarrel with you about something that had happened if I did not think you were being held to the same standard. Like we said here, the other man very rarely replies to hell with your standard. So we see that very often, People quarrel every day. People get into arguments about things. And if um, 
we do. We find that we try to make exceptions why that should be. Let me give you an example here. So I grow up, uh, or I live rather in this town. I live, have the privilege of living with a wonderful family and they have many kids and I've over the years watched them grow up. Um, but when one of the other, when one of the children accuses one of the other children of doing something or one of the parents tries to discipline a child, the child in question always tries to make an excuse. Not saying that their behavior wasn't wrong, but there was some exception to their behavior. Well, I only did this because my brother was doing this first, or he irritated me. Well, I didn't really slap her. I was really trying to push her face away. You see how they, we all do this. We try to correct our behavior. So it fits more in line with the standard that we know the other person is accusing us of not keeping. We seem very obsessed with doing this. But here's something that's also very interesting that comes right from the book. None of us are really keeping this law. This year or this month or more likely this very day, we have failed to practice ourselves the kind of behavior we expect from other people. There may be all sorts of excuses for us. That time you were so unfair to the children was when you were very tired. That slightly shady business about the money, the one you had almost forgotten, well, that came up when you were on very hard times. And what you promised to do for old so-and-so and have never done, well, you would have never promised it if you knew how frightfully busy you were going to be. And as far as your behavior to your wife or husband or sister or brother, if I knew how irritating they could be, I would not wonder at all. And who the dickens am I anyway? I am just the same. That is to say, I do not succeed in keeping this law very well. And the moment anyone tells me I am not keeping it, there starts up in my mind a string of excuses as long as your arm. The question at the moment is not whether they are good excuses. The point is that they are one more proof of how deeply, whether we like it or not, that we believe in this law of right and wrong. If we do not believe in decent behavior, why should we be so anxious to make excuses for not having behaved decently? Now, I'm not having you come up with answers yet. I'm just wanting you to wonder about these things. Look back on your own life this own this week, this year, today maybe, and see if these things have happened to you where someone has said a thing and you have reacted in this way. Now, C.S. Lewis makes a note, uh, mentioned that in the past people have called this the law of nature, not because it was a law of nature in the same way that, say, the law of gravity is a law of nature, but it was so natural to human beings um, that they just expect everyone to kind of know it. There may be someone, uh, a rare exception to someone who did not understand this law, but it was so natural. So you'll hear him refer to this as the law of nature um, as we go on. But at this point, I want to kind of break this down for you and say that C.S. Lewis has made two assertions about the way we behave from these things. Number one, human beings all over the earth have this curious idea that they ought to behave a certain way and cannot really get rid of it, right? Again, number one, human beings all over the earth have this curious idea that they ought to behave in a certain way and really can't get rid of it. Number two, they do not, in fact, behave in that way. They know the law of nature or the law of right and wrong and morality, once again, whatever you want to call it, and they break it. Number two, they do not, in fact, behave in the way that they think they ought to behave. They know this law of nature and they break it. So these are the assertions that C.S. Lewis is making right up front. And once again, we have to separate this law of human nature from the law of nature. For instance, when I drop a stone, it obeys the law of nature of gravity, right? Right? And it doesn't think about whether or not it ought to do it. So the law of nature as it applies in nature to any other organism talks about the things that are done when you drop a rock, it falls always, right? If gravity is being obeyed, if gravity is of this way according to the law. But if law of human nature does not say what humans do, it says what humans ought to do. And that's, I want you to remember that distinction as we move forward. Now, as soon as we bring up these two main points, there's a law that we seem to all know and we can't get rid of until we don't obey it there might rise some objections to saying that, hey, this is not really not a big deal. Here's some objections I want to talk about real quick. So objection number one, isn't what you call the moral law simply our herd or group instinct? And hasn't that been developed or evolved over time like all of our other instincts? So this morality we have as humans, isn't that just part of our, Chris, our, our natural evolution or progression as humans? Hasn't that been baked into us by our genes or by society? So... That's a, a common objection. It makes sense on paper, but I want to break this down in the same way that C.S. Lewis does. If you have two instincts right in you, right? let's say the instinct, uh, if you are in a dangerous situation, to help someone or to run away because there is a danger, um, 
to self-preserve, right? We have that strong self-preservation instinct or however you call it. You see it much stronger, of course, in animals. But let's say that we have this instinct in us to help someone who's hurt or to run away um, from the danger that hurt them, right? Now, of course, that instinct to run is going to be very, very strong. I think anyone who understands this dilemma or has been faced with it understands that their first inclination is to run. But whilst they are doing it, they find a third thing that is telling them that it is probably better to help your fellow man than to run, even though the instinct to run is stronger. So if you have this thing that's judging between the two instincts, it really can't itself be one of the instincts. For instance, I'm a musician, and I play guitar, and bow guitar, keys from time to time, and I have these notes that I play, right? They're C sharp, D, B, A, E, and they all have a certain quality to them. But at some times, it is good to play a C sharp. Other times, it is not good to play a C sharp, right? You'll notice that if you're playing a certain chord progression and you play a C sharp in the middle of that, well, it doesn't sound very good. It makes people wince, especially if you're on stage, you look out, you see everyone, mm, that doesn't sound good. Now, the thing that tells me whether or not C sharp is the right thing to play is my sheet music, right? I have the sheet music in front of me and it says play C sharp. That is the right note to play but it is not itself one of the notes. So I think it's, um, it's morality works the same way. Morality, there are lots of keys in our life that are our instinct, right? If you think of a keyboard or a piano, there are lots of keys in our heart, our emotions, our instinct, our chemical reactions, and they all have different purposes. But the thing that says which one of those is the right thing to do cannot itself be one of the keys. So morality while we're still trying to get our grip around it, I don't think it's one of the instincts. It doesn't make sense that it is an instinct that has developed because it can't itself choose between two other instincts. That doesn't make much sense. Another objection that comes up is more specific where it says, okay, well, we'll grant you that, but hey, isn't this moral law or this right and wrong stuff, well, isn't that just part of society? Whether you're in America or across sea in Europe or anywhere else, isn't this right or wrong specific to my society. Isn't this just a societal convention that is kind of taught us by our schools or our parents, right? So that's true that we're taught things in society. We're all taught things by authority, right? Most of the things you believe are on authority. But think about this as, ter- as far as morality relates to society. Even though societies over time and eras and different cultures vary. For instance, if I compared the morality of myself to say the morality of the ancient Greeks before the Roman Empire, I can see that things are quite different, couldn't I, right? But a lot of the things are still similar, right? We see a lot of similarities. Nations differ in the morality, but not so much as people think. For instance, we may have different views from a different nation as far as how many spouses you should take, right? A man might say, hey, I can have one wife or five wives, but all nations agree that you should not just have whatever woman you want. There's there's a kind of a common understanding there. I could spend more time in this, but of course we need to keep moving. But ask yourself these questions if you think that morality is just a social convention. Well, ask yourself this. Have some societies been more moral than other societies? Have they made progress or improved? Do you think your society has made progress or improved? But if you think morality is just a social convention, it's just preference. It's just put into us by society. You can't really measure progress, can you? None of us can. I would think, and I would like to think, that most societies on the planet today, especially the greater world powers of today, whether they be um, over here in the West or out there in the East, would say that, hey, we would like to say that our moral conventions of our society are better than, say, those of Nazi Germany, right? Most of us would like to say that we conduct ourselves better than Adolf Hitler did when he led his nation. Now, this, of course, is not reflecting on anything that Germany is doing now, but Germany back in the early 1930s and 40s, right? It was a different time, a different mindset, and different moral standards. But we'd all like to say that we are doing better than that. But here's the trick. The moment that you say one set of moral ideas can be better than another, especially between nations, you are, in fact, measuring them both by a standard, saying that one of them conforms to that standard more nearly than the other one. But the standard that measures the two things itself is not is something different. For instance, if I have a ruler, right, and I have made a ruler in shop class or I bought a ruler and I see my friend and he has a ruler and the ruler seems shorter than mine and mine seems longer. I'm like, well, I really need to measure a foot, right? You would go to the standard of measurements of 
um, feet that I believe they have locked somewhere in France. Um, someone can correct me on that, but they have somewhere I know they have the standard. They have this is a foot, right? In order for me to know if my foot, my ruler is closer to a foot than my friend's foot, his ruler, I mean, um, I need, we need both need to go and compare to this standard, right? We have to say this is closer to a foot. So my foot, my ruler is more correct. It's closer to a more accurate foot. And we do this as nations, as people. We compare ourselves to other nations. I'm like, am I better than this nation? Am I better than this person? And the only way we're able to do that is by, in, in our minds, holding up to a standard. So I don't think it's something that's in us by societal means alone. Of course, it's conveyed that way, but I don't think it's the birth child of our society, these morals that we hold ourselves to. Now, we also see, once again, that we don't, remember, we have this law that we feel obligated to obey, but we just don't do it, do we, right? We have this law that we don't. So, in anything, any system of anything, like whether you have a computer or a guitar, there are always consequences for that computer or guitar behaving in a way that it's not supposed to behave, right? Sometimes those consequences are very light, but sometimes they're severe. If my guitar sounds out of tune, I don't know if I can play with this guitar, or I need to retune it. If my guitar is not working, I may need to get a new hard drive, or I may need to increase the size of the RAM that's inside of my computer. But there are always consequences for something not behaving as it ought to. And someone might say, well, hey, Chris, I think you're being a little harsh on humanity. I mean, nobody's perfect, and you're right. Nobody is perfect. We're, that's exactly what we're saying. But someone might say, hey, isn't this inconsistency of adhering to some kind of moral law just a matter of what's convenient or beneficial to my person? For instance, don't I do things that you say are right only because they happen to benefit me, right? For instance, I will, might give charity to someone because it makes me feel good and I have change to spare. Or I might... um forgive this person because it's in my benefit to do so politically. Or I might give this person a fund because I might want to call on him on a favor in the future, et cetera. You can go down on the list of ways I think that morality might benefit me. But consider this example, right? When there are two people who wrong you, um, you grow far more angry with the man who tried purposely to do it than you do with the man who did so on a complete accident. For instance, um, I have had the unfortunate mispleasure as a someone who drives a car, um, to occasionally get hit or hit someone while I am in my car. Um, praise the Lord, this does not happen very frequently, but it has happened in the past. Now, um, sometime last year, I was hit by a young man who, it was a complete accident. He wasn't paying attention. He was, his, his face kind of went completely white and he was very nervous and, and, and sweating. And um, he knew that what he had done was very wrong, but you could see in his face and in the tone of his voice and in the shake of his person um, that it was a complete accident. And I might have been, and I was, a little jipped with him at first, but I wasn't super mad with him in the end, and um, the whole situation was solved very amicably. But if this man, for some reason, during rush hour, had rammed up behind me and forcibly hit my car in a way that he wanted to hit my car and made no means or attempt to hide that fact that he had intended to hit my car, I would be very furious with him. Why did you hit my car? Why would you do such a thing? Right? So both of those things inconvenienced me, but I grow far more mad with the second one. Here's an example that C.S. Lewis gives, right? A man occupying a corner seat because he got there first and a man who slipped into it while my back was turned and removed my bag are both e equally inconvenient, but I blame the second man. I do not blame the first, right? When we are trying to bring up this law of morality, well, I'm not going to argue with the guy who accidentally hit my car and Mr. Lewis is not going to argue morally with the person who happened to be in the seat that he wanted to take, right? But I would argue morally with the guy who tried to take my seat or the guy who purposefully and maliciously hit my car. I would try to bring up this moral law that I expected the other man to know about. So it's more than just a matter of inconvenience. Okay. So what we're going to do right now, I want you today is to think about these, uh, these things that Lewis has brought up and these objections to it. Once again, and I, I think I forgot to mention this, if you would like to participate in the show, um, there are a couple ways you can do that. Once ago, um, you can you can text Veracity, V-E-R-A-S, or excuse me, V-E-R-A-C, I need to learn to spell, I-T-Y, V-E-R-A-C-I-T-Y to the number 555-888. Um, and if you do that, you can text the show questions either while we're live or off air, um, and uh, you can request topics or guests that you would like to see on the show. Um, if you would like to call in right now, and engage in this conversation. The number is 
to Strive. That's 505-278-7483. 505-278-7483. If you would like to join into this discussion or have a question about what we've been talking about today. Um, first, before we do that, I want you to think about what we've been talking about today. We're going to go to a short break, and when we come back, we're going to sum up what we've been talking about, and we're going to see if we have some answers for why this law is in our hearts. So stay tuned. We'll be right back after a quick word from some of our sponsors. You're listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. Evangelical Christians are talking about hell. What if we believe what we believe because we've always believed it? What if the gospel is really a matter of life and death? We want you to open your mind, open your Bible, and rethink hell. At RethinkingHell.com, evangelicals look at what the Bible says about hell, putting conventional and controversial views to the test. People are talking a lot about health care these days. There are so many changes, so many questions. As Christians, where can we turn for answers? Well, at Samaritan Ministries, we believe the answer is in Jesus Christ, working in the lives of His people, demonstrating Christian community by sharing each other's medical needs, scripturally, faithfully. Here's just part of Lana's story in her own words. I love getting the monthly share that I give to each month that has a name of a real person and their real medical concerns and a prayer request, you know, for them. That I get to interact with people from all over the country, just like me, and get to pray for them and know that they're praying for me when I have a need. It's great. I love it. Lana is just one of over 200,000 members who are sharing over $23 million in medical needs each month. If you'd like to experience what it's like to partner with other Christians for your health care needs, and you'd like to see what other members are saying, visit MySamaritanStory.org. All right, welcome back to Veracity Hill. Thank you for hanging out with us after the break. If you want to call in and be part of the show, the number is 505-2-STRIVE. That's 505-278-7483, 505-278-7483. If you'd like to have your voice in, on the show or chime in about what we're uh, doing today, if you are friends with me on Facebook specifically, you can leave a comment there or on our speaker page. There's actually a chat function. If you don't feel like calling in or can't uh, remember the number, if you click on the podcast that you're listening to right now, you can actually chat and we will see it and we will address the answer question or concern on the show today. Um, so I want to sum up everything we talked about real quick. Um, I'm going to do it as quickly as possible here so we can continue going on. So we find ourselves uh, in ourselves a certain law concerning right and wrong or fair play that we expect our fellow humans to know by default, right? This is the way we act in our day to day, a law that we did not invent and which we know we ought to obey. So this kind of presents a very uh, interesting situation for us. We have this law in us concerning right or wrong or fair play or whatever you want to call it that we expect our fellow humans to know about. We didn't invent it. We know we ought to obey it and we consistently fail to keep it, right? When ourselves, we didn't invent it, but we find it within ourselves. Okay. Is everyone tracking with me? So this is usually when the human condition questions start to kick in, no matter where you're coming from. Remember, we're not talking about Christianity yet or at all. We're not talking about God or gods or any worldview quite yet. We're just addressing everything that we run into as human beings. And this is when human beings start wondering, hey, is there any meaning to life or the universe? Why do I feel the way I feel? Who am I? All these questions start to kick in, usually when you come across a moral dilemma like this. We have this thing inside us that we didn't invent, but we know we ought to obey. And it's and we expect all the other humans to be the same way. Now, I'm going to bring in some worldviews, but I'm going to keep them as broad as possible just so we can categorize some of these things. So when we start talking about the universe and these questions, which by the way, uh, these are not new questions. Every human being who has ever breathed air has wondered this, has wrestled with these things. So welcome to the club. Um, this is not something new, um, but it's so old sometimes that it is new. So over the course of time, there have been two very broad views. And, and if you have been a human, you have taken one of these two paths when trying to answer these questions. Um, there's the materialist view and the non-materialist view or the religious view. I'm not adhering to any specific religion, 
We're just saying that sometimes a non-materialist view is called the religious view. So the materialist view says would say very shortly, and it has a lot of other views underneath. This umbrella view would say there is not a power or force behind the universe. And the obviously the non-materialist view would say there is a power or force behind the universe. Now we need to figure out which one of those things is true. So this is where um this is where we kind of have to go beyond what we're able to measure in physically with matter and energy in, in the realm of science. And we have to kind of look at something different. We have to look at ourselves, right? We have inside information. We have our, uh, I am a man and I can look inside and, and see in what things are relatable to mankind. By the way, when I, when I talk, uh, and when C.S. Lewis talks about men here, he's of course referring to the entirety of mankind, both sexes of the human race. Um, and that's how we'll be using it most of the day today. So let me read something that C.S. Lewis says here. We do not merely observe men. We are men. In this case, we have, so to speak, inside information. We are in the know. And because of that, we know that men find themselves under a moral law which they did not make and cannot quite forget, even when they try, and which they know they ought to obey. Notice the following point. Anything out studying man from the outside, let's say an alien species or some other thing, right, that is here with us. Anything studying man from the outside as we study let's say, electricity or cabbages, not knowing our language and consequently not being able to get any inside information about us, but merely observing what we did would never get the slightest evidence that we had this moral law. How could they? For their observations would only show what we did and the moral law is about what we ought to do. In the same way, if there were anything above or behind the observed facts in the case of stones or weather, we, by studying them from the outside, could never hope to discover it. So, we know these things about stones and, and the weather and the things we observe by observing them from the outside. But if anything, we're observing us from the outside. And when we observe humanity from the outside, we cannot, not, um, in essence, discover a moral law. And we need to try and figure out, is there something behind this law, a something or a someone? We're not saying what it might be or what it is. Um, for instance, for, think of it this way, right? I get mail and you get mail. Um, and I live, like I said, in my apartment. And I've had roommates over time that have come and gone. Now I live alone. But... Um, sometimes their mail still comes to my apartment. Now, I don't open their mail. I'm, I, I think of myself as a good roommate. I don't open their mail. I don't invade their privacy. I put it off to the side for them to pick up at a later date. Um, but I get mail. And I can, by looking at their envelopes, um, the size of the envelope, the color, the weight, um, the texture, I can discern what that might be inside that envelope because I get similar envelopes. And I know when I open this envelope, there's a bill. And when I open this envelope, it's a greeting card. And when I open this envelope, it's a wedding invitation. Um, and I can judge what might be in their envelopes based on what is in my envelope. So I can observe myself as a man and you can observe yourself as a man or a woman. And you can kind of make assumptions about what might also be in your fellow men or women. Um, that's what C.S. Lewis is saying here. Um, and when we examine these laws in ourselves, we find that there is some kind of thing in us that we didn't put there. And if it wasn't put there by me, it must have been put there by something or someone else outside of this law. And that's where we find ourselves right now. There's something or someone outside of the law. Before we continue, um, we have uh, a caller on the line. It looks like it uh, might be Kurt. So I'm going to put him on here. Kurt, uh, are you there? Hello, Kurt. Hey, thanks for having me, Chris. Hey, Kurt, how's it going? Good, good, good. Hey, you're doing a great job. Um, I just had a remark here about um, you talking about the, the materialist or, uh, say, naturalist position here. Yes. And um, I like the analogy you're talking about here with the mail pointing, um, the, the envelopes, you know, p pointing to something beyond it. Um, because I think that when um, naturalists try to ground the moral law um, in, say, evolutionary process, I think they they fail to remember that evolution just tells us what happens, as mm. you previously mentioned, not just what ought to happen. Right. And so, since since morality is uh, is about what ought to happen, um, you know, the, the, trying to ground morality in the evolutionary process doesn't do the trick, um, because evolution changes, and so what we ought to do you know, very well might change, which means, as you pointed out, there there should be, these are just preferences, you know, there's no real ought behind it, so. Right, right. So yeah, so that's that's a good analogy with, with we need to point to something beyond 
beyond ourselves to ground uh, morality. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all I wanted to, to say. I don't know. Um, I guess if I had to ask a question to you, I'd say something like, um, "So, with the with the evolution, uh, with with the envelope uh, example, mm-hmm. um, h- how would you say that that fails?" I mean, it points beyond, it would have to point beyond, but where is the oughtness maybe? Or maybe that's not the point of the analogy, but the analogy points to something else. It does point to something else. And we're actually um, going to be getting to that in just a second of what, you know, what is the something behind sure. the law that we feel? Um, and if you are a materialist or a naturalist, all right, and you're coming from that viewpoint, um, we right now, we haven't said which one of these things is true. We just say what we're perceiving as as human beings. And if and if you if you are of the materialist nature where you say, well, these... This morality that we feel in us, Chris, I, I really appreciate your discussion, but it's it's all part of these chemical processes and materials, things and matter and energy. Um, that's perfectly fair. And if that's true, then you don't have much more discussion to have. Like that's that'll be a very easy question for you to answer um, because it's just part of our, you know, our our uh, material and chemical process. But if you are not thinking that way, um, this is the path we are going to go down as far as, well, we have some other questions that need to be answered because it, it appears to me when I open my envelope, so to speak, that there's something outside the law. That's what. Um, that's what we're going to get ready to talk about next. Yeah. Sure. Cool. So, awesome. Well, thanks so much for my call, Chris. So thank you so much, Kurt, for being on. Have a great day. You too. Take care. All right. Thanks to our uh, our fearless leader, Kurt, for calling in and contributing today. All right. So right now we're at a point where we think there's a something or someone behind the law. Right now, remember, we're not talking about a specific god or gods or any religion. We haven't even touched this yet. We've had some indicators of a wide cone of worldview that it may not be. And if you believe in um, that it's just part of our, you know, chemical reactions and part of the universe and material things, um, I hope you won't be offended where we're going because, quite frankly, when you answer it from the materialistic worldview, it's very easy to answer. If that's what you want to, if that's the path you want to go down, then it won't be very hard for you um, to contribute to that point. But we're going to be going from the non material worldview or that scope of worldviews. And we say that we have a someone or something behind the law. And we have two pieces of evidence that kind of say, okay, we want to get to know this or discover what it is. What is this something or someone behind this law that we feel? So there are two big pieces of evidence that can kind of direct us to what is this force or power or thing like? And we have two pieces of evidence. One is the universe itself. If we look at the universe, because since this thing must be outside the universe, it might have contributed to the way the universe is now, Right. It might have contributed to this thing that it may be created or set into motion or is constantly shaping or being part of whatever. Right? We see this universe, and I can derive from the universe that um, just very plainly, and Mr. Lewis makes the same assumptions, that um, the universe, he must be, he or it must be a lover of beauty because the universe is a very beautiful place. Um, it is. You see things and you're like, wow, that looks beautiful. That seems beautiful. It feels beautiful. But at the same time, um, we can derive that this thing is maybe not a friend to man because the universe is a very harsh place. It's very easy for humans to die outside of the comforts of our cities. We're not really acclimatized for a lot of the natural habitats on our own planet, let alone the rest of the universe. Um, And it's very easy for us to die. We're we're, we're frail little things. Um, So maybe this thing that made the universe or is part of the the force behind it, maybe he's not a friend to man or, or whatever. So we can contribute those things, but the second piece of evidence that we've been talking about, and this is a better piece of evidence, is the moral law that we've been talking about today. This power force most likely is contributing to this moral law that I didn't invent, but I find inside myself and that I don't obey. So here's some things we can can we can we can pull from the fact that we have this universe and the, specifically this moral law, right? If you look at the moral law, we might be able to pull some characteristics of this someone behind the law. So here are some things C.S. Lewis says, and this is important. This is kind of the crux of the whole day. If you talk about the moral law, there's nothing indulgent about the moral law. It is as hard as nails. It tells you to do the straight thing, and it does not seem to care how painful, dangerous, or difficult it is. Everyone likes doing the right thing until he has to consistently do the right thing because that's usually the hard thing. There are a lot of times when it would be very incon- or very convenient for me if the right thing were not the right thing and I could go do something else that was not so hard and difficult. But most of the time, the right thing happens to be the hardest thing. And if any of you have ever tried to do something right consistently, you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
So this moral law does not seem to have any sympathy for how difficult something is. It says, this is the thing you need to do. Do it. And no matter what kind of reasoning you give inside yourself, even if you try to forget the moral law, you find yourself pressed against that. Like, no matter what excuse you make, the thing that you're being pressed on is still the right thing in your mind. You don't know what to do about it. So let's talk about the someone behind the law who seems to have this very strong sense of fair play, right? Very strong sense of fair play. He has a strong sense of beauty. And he has a strong sense of um, reality. He's very harsh on humans, right? So when we talk about this this moral law and this power behind the law, here's something that C.S. Lewis says about this someone behind the law. The trouble is that on one part, that one part of you is on his side and really agrees with his disapproval of human greed and trickery and exploitation. I would say that's true of all of us. You may want him to make an exception in your own case to let you off this one time, but you know at bottom that unless the power behind the world really and unalterably, unalterably, excuse me, detests that sort of behavior, then he cannot be good. On the other hand, we know that if there does exist an absolute goodness, it must hate most of what we do. Think about that for a second. Once again, we're not talking about any particular entity right now, but we're talking about this possibility. If there is someone behind the moral law that he invented or it invented, and it is very concerned with these things, and it is absolutely good, it must hate most of what we do. All human beings have this moral law in them, this fair play no matter where you're coming from, what worldview, what religion, what time period you've lived in or live in, you have this sense of fair play in you. And you see that it is coming from a place that you did not create, you didn't invent it, but you expect everyone to know about. And this power behind the law is very obsessed with this fair play, is very obsessed with beauty, and is very hard as nails. And it's absolutely good. And if it is absolutely good, we can't get around the fact that it must hate most of what I do. Most of what you do, because you and I both know this law we have inside ourselves, we don't keep it. We can't dismiss it, but we can't keep it. This is a dilemma, isn't it? There's this thing or power behind the law that appears that we may have greatly upset. Now, I'm going to go ahead and bring a worldview in for a moment. It's after we have realized that there's this real moral law and a power behind the law and that we have broken that law and you have put yourself at wrong with that power, which it apparently we have. It is after all this and not a moment sooner that Christianity begins to talk. Now, I'm not saying whether or not Christianity is right or not, but the truth of Christianity cannot be explained unless you first understand this point. There is a moral law, we've broken it, the power behind the law, and we've put ourselves at wrong with it. There must be some, there must follow that there might be some consequences for that. So, What are we to do? It makes our human situation look very bleak. And we can talk about this more um, next episode, and we will. Or not next episode, but the next time we bring up this topic. Um, Whether or not that's next week or several weeks from now is really dependent upon what you guys want to talk about um, and how you receive this. But um, what follows is that we have a lot of worldviews, right? And I want you to put your worldview cap back on for a second. Once again, I think we've barely mentioned God And we've mentioned Christianity just once now, but we're not going to be talking about which worldview is right. Merely that we've addressed this question of this moral law that we have to answer and that there are some worldviews that try to answer it, right? Um, And that we need to address it. But one thing that we absolutely cannot do is say that any of them will do. And I know that's very attractive, but I want to spend the rest of our time talking about that point. Um, That it's okay to just kind of accept whatever worldview you want to. Um, in light of trying to answer this moral dilemma we face as human beings, as all human beings. Um, And so there's this very popular, especially in the Western world here, there's this very popular concept that it doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you are sincere. As long as you follow that path, you're going to be okay. Everything will be fine. And it was very, very popular when I was in college. It's still popular today. Um, But I want to talk about why that may be wrong. I don't want to say what beliefs are wrong. Not yet. But I want to talk about why this may not be an acceptable way. And to do that, I have a talk here from uh, a man named Dr. Michael Ramsden. He gave a a talk at my church uh, that I was part of uh, over 10 years ago in 2005. Um, 
the quality on the recording is a little low, so I apologize for that, but you can hear him fine enough. Um, this is a section of the talk. It's not the whole talk, but it's a section of the talk that he talks about, hey, do all paths lead to God? Or do all, let's, let's broaden it out a little bit, do all paths lead to this someone or something behind the law? So let's talk about that real quick and see what answers we come to. This is Dr. Michael Ramson. He uh, has been or is, uh, I need to brush up on my uh, current events, associated with Rabbi Zacharias, um, and he is a brilliant speaker from Oxford. So uh, let's go ahead and listen to this talk by Michael Ramsden now. Let me, um, let me thank Greg for his very kind, generous introduction, and also for your very warm welcome. And um, it's great to be with you this morning. I'm just praying you'll be able to understand my funny accents as I speak to you. Um, I have uh, three small children, and one of whom isn't well at the moment, and so I'm sure her mother would appreciate your prayers. Um, two girls, a little boy. My son was four um, just about a month ago, and uh, he wanted a plastic suit of armor to dress up as a knight, um, which we bought him, um, which was probably a mistake, because the next morning he came into, my, into our bedroom dressed completely in this plastic suit of armor carrying the plastic sword and said, Daddy, I'm placing you under arrest for eating too much. And, um, and so he obviously gets that cruel sense of humor from his mother. Um, and um, the six-year-old Lucy, she's not well, and our 18-month-old, 19-month-old now, Amelia, um, she's doing fine, but she just needs to start to sleep. And um, I'd just like to also, while I'm here, just thank Jerry Thwombley for his kind invitation to come out here and um, for the things he's organized. And since the, if you're visiting here, the regular pastor of the church, senior pastor, is away, so he has no idea what's happening. Um, uh, but Jerry made something happen in his absence. Now, I've been asked to speak this morning on the subject of don't all paths lead to God. And it's something, I suppose, which is, to many people, a very attractive idea. The idea that maybe, ultimately, all paths lead to God. I was speaking in a um, sort of private members club in London uh, a couple of years ago now, and at the end of a particular talk I'd given, we threw the floor open for questions, and uh, the first question was from a guy who said, look, Michael, all paths um, lead to God. They're like different paths up a mountain, and you may well have heard this illustration. You know, there are lots of different paths that go to the top of the mountain, you just happen to be on the Christian path, and there are lots of other people on the other kinds of paths. And um, they said, so, you know, what makes you think you've got the only way? And uh, I looked at the person, and I just said, can I ask you a question? And they said, yes. I said, have you ever climbed to the top of a mountain? And they said, yes. I said, tell me, when you're standing, where do you need to be standing to know that all paths go to the top of a mountain? Where do you need to be? And he said, at the top. I said, really? I said, well, last time you were standing on the top of a mountain, could you see where all paths led from the base? And he shook his head. I said, where do you need to be standing to know that all paths go to the top? And the answer is not on the top, you have to be up here. And he said, yeah, you're right. And then I said, who is the only person who has that bird's eye view? And he said, God. I said, who are you claiming to be when you tell me that you can see your paths go to the top? At this point, he looked a bit worried. <laughs> there are all these kinds of illustrations which, which float around. As a matter of fact, it is the height of arrogance to claim such a perspective because you're basically saying, I can see what no one else can see. And as a matter of fact, you need to be divine to have that kind of view. I was um, um, speaking at another event um, about a year ago, and um, at the end of the event, we took a lot of questions, and a, a Buddhist lady uh, came up to me, and she said, Michael, I'm concerned about um, something that you implied in your talk. It wasn't said expressly, but I am concerned about it, because you seem to assume it. She said, you seem to assume that Christianity is the only way. And um, her question wasn't about the attractiveness of saying there are many paths. She said, isn't that arrogant? She said, isn't that awfully, um, you know, how can you be so presumptuous to think you're the only one who has the right view? And um, she said, I've thought about becoming a Christian, but I don't want to become like you. I don't want to become a, a bad person. And so for her, what she was saying was this, look, I want to be a good person, I want to be a moral person, but to become a Christian means that you say there is only one way to God, and that means that you become a morally bad person. And I don't want to become morally worse by becoming a Christian. That was her argument against the Christian faith. And so I, I asked if I could ask her for some questions, and she agreed. So I just said, look, tell me, um, did not Buddha say that he believed that the Hindu Vedas were not divine revelation from God, 
and that the Hindus were fundamentally mistaken in their belief in the caste system. This idea that some people are born at a higher level than others. And she looked at me and her, her jaw dropped open and she said, he did. I read it yesterday in my daily devotionals. And I said, well, if Buddha were here right now, he would tell you that over a billion Hindus are wrong in their beliefs. And she said, I don't like where this conversation is going. I said, look, I appreciate the fact you may not like it, but all I'm saying to you is this, is that Buddha believed that the Hindus were wrong. But if you're willing to be a Buddhist, even though Buddha said some people are wrong, why aren't you willing to entertain the person of Christ, even though he said that some people were wrong? And she said, I'm still not happy with this. So I said, why don't you go away and think about it for a while? We live in a culture where people struggle with the idea that some things are exclusive. And the solution to it is therefore to embrace everything and to say it doesn't matter what you believe so long as you are sincere and so long as you follow that path, you're going to be okay. But actually, no matter how you phrase that position, you're going to end up being exclusive. If someone says that all paths lead to God, you exclude those and say they are wrong who only believe that some paths go to God or mainly only one path goes to God. If you say only some paths go to God, because you're not convinced that Adolf Hitler, for example, had the right path to God, if you say, look, only some paths lead to God, you are saying and excluding those who say all paths go to God, or only one. Just like if you say one path goes to God, you are excluding others. It doesn't matter what position you take on this spectrum, at some point you will end up excluding someone somewhere. Because it is the very nature of truth to exclude that which would come against it and to contradict it. We live in a culture where we are very sensitive about the ideas of arrogance, about ideas of exclusivity. And actually, I'll be giving a talk uh, tomorrow about the university on Is Christianity Arrogant? Is that, have I got the right title for the right university tomorrow? Um, I think so. So you must forgive me, I'm still suffering a little bit from jet lag. But what I want to say to you this morning is that it is not like there are lots of different religions all claiming the same kind of thing, all ultimately going to the same place. When I was in India um, um, a while ago, I was listening to a colleague and he was telling the story and he said, look, I was on a train and I was with this woman and we were going um, into town, or on a bus, sorry, and we were going into the centre of the town where they lived. And that's what she said, he and I got, she and I got talking and this woman, when she found out that my friend was a Christian, said, oh, you Christians, you think you have the only path to God. She said, but right now we're on the number 20 bus and we are going into town. But on the other side of the city, there are some people on north of the city, and they're on the number 40 bus, and they are also going into town. And to the east of us, there's the number 10 bus. And the people on that bus, they're also going into town. We are all on different buses, and we are all going to the same place. And my friend told me the story and how he related to it, and when he finished, I started to laugh, and I said, you know, our minds, they work slightly differently. As you were telling the story, what I wanted to say to this woman was this. Look, after you have done your shopping and you want to go home, will you take the number 20 bus you are on now, or will you take the number 40 bus that will take you north, or the number 10 bus that will take you east? It is not that everyone in this world is starting from a different starting point, moving towards a common destination. We all have a common starting point. We're going to different destinations. I'm asking you to check the ticket to see where it's going to drop you off. All of us struggle with the idea that maybe there is some kind of exclusivity, but it is simply not the case. And you simply cannot argue, it doesn't matter what you believe, and that all things are the same. Surely everyone in this room is going to agree that there is going to be a different outworking. If, for example, you have the political philosophy of Saddam Hussein, then let's say if you have the political philosophy of um, Abraham Lincoln. And not only just the fact that if different political philosophies de deliver different results in society, different religious convictions will deliver different results in society. It's not that they happen to, it is because they teach different things, say different things, argue different things. In all of my travels, when I've been to India, we go to the Middle East a fair amount, where we speak to all kinds of people, including very militant um, Islamic groups. When we go to the Far East and talk to Buddhists, I have yet to have someone come up to me and say, you know, as I listen to what you have to say about the Christian faith, it's the same as ours. All of them, outside of the West, whatever country I'm in, recognize the fact that Christianity has something fundamentally different to say. It is only in the West where we actually believe all religions are basically the same, but superficially different. Once you are out there in those different countries that actually are well versed in their own religion and understand its basis, what it's saying, what it's teaching and what it's arguing, they are very willing to concede the point that Christianity is not similar to what they actually have to say and argue. All right, that's Dr. Michael Ramsden. Um, 
the rest of that talk is excellent. We may share it at a later date. Um, but do you understand what he's saying here? He's saying um, it's very important that you check your ticket to see what bus you're on. And that's that's my goal as we wrap up today's show is once again, even though I, of course, am coming from a worldview and I believe what I am saying is true from a worldview, today we're not talking about which worldviews are true. We're talking about this problem that we all face as human beings and it's something I want you to be sure that you're not messing around with, that you understand that pursuing a a la carte option is not going to solve this moral dilemma that you face as a human being, that I face as a human being. Not all paths lead to God. Not all paths lead to the answer to this law of right and wrong, to the someone or something behind the law. Um, there may be many paths that get close, but we need, I'm asking you not to necessarily bend to a specific worldview at this point in time. That's not what this discussion is about. But I'm asking you to carefully consider the journey there. You must carefully consider that this is to be taken seriously. And I want you to take it seriously. I want you to, to not apply um, the silliness that he's talking about where all paths lead to God and we can be, you know, we can be all inclusive that way and everything will be fine. And that sounds great on paper. Believe me, it does. But if it's not true, that doesn't help you or I at all, does it? If it's not true, if we get to the end of the line and discover that we were wrong all along about what we believed in anything, um, there are always consequences for that. But that's, um, that's what I want to kind of leave you with today. And I want to leave you with one last quote from C.S. Lewis here uh, from his book uh, in, this, in this section. Uh, there has been a great deal of soft soap talked about God for the last hundred years. That is not what I am offering. You can cut all that out. So Lewis and Mr. Ramsden and myself are all very serious about making sure that you take this seriously, that we all take this seriously, and then we all um, don't try and be silly about it. So there's a moral law inside of us. We have to respond to that. There may be, and most likely is, a something or someone or a force or a power behind that law. And it's silly of us to think that we can make up a way to uh, to address the moral dilemma and make our way, our path to this someone or something behind the law. So that's what I want to leave you with today as we wrap up today's show. I want to thank you for listening to our discussion about morality, right and wrong as a clue to the meaning of the universe. Think on these things. Meditate on them carefully. Um, once again, if you want to text a comment or a question and some feedback from the things you heard today, you can text Veracity, V E R A. C-I-T-Y to the number 555-888 to begin uh, receiving text from us. And anytime you can text that number to send us any feedback or questions you may have. Once again, if you're listening to Spreaker, uh, you can leave a comment on the Spreaker page or you can call in on this number 505-278-7483. Even when we're not live, you can call on that number and leave a message and we can address it or call you back later. Um, we typically re- address these on the show. So if you would like to have something said on the show or you would like to talk to one of us personally, we'd love to walk you through some of the things that we talked about today. So I'm grateful for the continued support of our patrons and partnership with our sponsors, Defenders Media. Consult Kevin, The Sky Floor, Rethinking Hell, the Illinois Family Institute, and Evolution 2.0. I am thankful so much for the great minds before me who have gone ahead and thought about these things carefully, Mr. C.S. Lewis and Dr. Michael Ramsden. I'm very thankful to um, our fearless commander-in-chief, Kurt Jarrus, for creating uh, Defenders Media and Veracity Hill and a pl- giving us a place to talk about these things and strive for truth, no matter what that truth is, to find the answers that we seek in all of these arenas in life. Um, I want to thank you so much for bearing with me today, despite the change in programming and and listening to these things. Um, and I just want to thank you so much for continuing to strive for truth in faith, politics, and society. Take care. You've been listening to Veracity Hill, striving for truth on faith, politics, and society. This is a listener-supported program. For more resources, including past shows, visit veracityhill.com.